Hello, everyone. Uh, we are back uh, at the uh, Quant Financial Engineering um, podcast for, and I said that every time, an interesting uh, uh, podcast and topic, but this one is really interesting. Uh, first of all, because uh, the, um, the topic is a very uh, topic that is dear, very dear to my heart. It's called the geometry of time. And I have um, the perfect person to, to, to discuss it, to, to, to introduce you to it. And so you could have a nice conversation. I have uh, Gurash Sangha, who is a former uh, quant research head at uh, Token Metrics. Um, he will be um, uh, with Aria as well, that uh, has found some interesting in the topic. So they will both uh, be on the line. So uh, let Garage, let's just start by saying, um, give us a little bit of background about yourself and then introduce the topic and we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks very much for having myself and Aria. Great. Uh, it's, uh, you know, listen to a number of your podcasts and they're always uh, quite interesting and quite informative. So for myself, um, my background is is largely in financial markets, both legacy and crypto. I um, you know graduated from Brown University, uh, you know, some time back with degrees in engineering, economics, and pre medicine. Uh, did a tour at Goldman Sachs and uh, CSFB in the research area, and eventually moved on to the trading side. Traded actually crude oil options on the floor of the New York Merc Mercantile Exchange. Moved upstairs, you know, ran a number of uh, global macro, um, you know. Uh, market neutral equity, you know, vol and equity vol R portfolios for several years, and um, you know, eventually was managed uh, you know, the entire strategy and risk at a very large hedge fund about six billion in capital. Got a bit more involved in data science, machine learning. I uh, ended up leading the data science, risk and market intelligence team at State Street, uh, building a competitive platform to BlackRock Aladdin, and you know. Through that tour, started getting more involved in crypto, and in the last few years have been uh, in the trenches in crypto, and in particular trying to apply a lot of the traditional quant and sort of emerging, you know, factor-based models in uh, the legacy markets into the crypto space. And through that um, journey, uh, you know, one of the most challenging aspects, uh, as I'm sure you know, is is not only you know when we're you know talking markets and trying to understand direction and risk is the time component. You know, there are t periods in, in markets and in life in general, which uh, there's tremendous, um, you know, it's quite sanguine, quite calm. And other times there's enormous amounts of volatility. And the challenge we had particularly from trading volatility was because there's this time component, uh, you know, particularly when you're long vol, you're always fighting decay, is could we develop an approach that at least narrowed that, uh, you know, beyond what, you know, traditional models, quant approaches um, you know, things like log periodic power law, uh, could we, you know, figure out something uh, with a bit more deep? And then, you know, th 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 you know, for the past number of years, I've looked at this particular aspect, this time aspect from a number of different angles, um, you know, mathematic, mathematical, quantitative, uh, but also much more qualitative and behavioral. And, uh, you know, it's a fairly interesting topic. Okay, so, um... Let's jump into uh, what do you mean by the geometry of time? So when we think of time, um, you know, most uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, you know, research in this area is the assumption is that there's a linearity to it and that uh, you know, events occur sequentially and, and you know, we as humans and let's say other biological beings you know, process time sequentially. And what I've found is that um, you know, when we actually look at markets, um, you know, there are a number of factors. You know, for example, we're looking at, let's say, the S&P 500 index, the, you know, the recent sell-off, you know, in part driven by interest rates, uh, inflation expectations, you know, changes in monetary policy, you know, the, the war, the Ukraine-Russia conflict, you know, among others. Um, but the, the question that I started asking myself is that, is it necessarily true that, um, events happen sequentially or is there is is there a, a dimension to time or a way to measure time um, which influences you know asset trajectories in a non-linear way and in that regard 
you know, started to do some more investigative work on, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, Einstein when he when he talks about uh, the theories of uh, special relativity that space and time are in, in, in inextricably connected. Um, you know, you know, talking about like non accelerating observers and things of that nature, um, but also. You know, the, when you kind of expand it to the general theory of relatively, you know, massive objects warp the fabric of space time. Is there something comparable from a market perspective that's practical, that's applicable, that could help, um, you know, gauge assessments and, in, 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 you know, from a sort of quantitative perspective, trajectories? And the, in that uh, regard, uh, you know, there, there wasn't actually a whole deal of literature uh, with respect to time in and of itself. I mean, there's enormous amounts of literature. With respect to applying quantitative techniques, uh, you know, factor-based models, machine learning models, um, you know, spectral analysis, Fourier analysis, on and on, and so then that was that was fundamentally my question: that are there, you know, we've we, we know that there's you know generally four seasons in a year, you know, there's day and night, there there's there's cycles in different aspects of existence, but is there, is you know, is there some sort of cycles uh, in markets themselves, and if there is. Uh, is this purely linear? If it's linear, you know, they constantly fail when we actually try them. And so therefore, is there, is there, is there, is there another geometry to them, something that we could potentially measure uh, in quantify and actually develop models around? I think, I think you're on. Uh, the, you, 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 um, you know, the Egyptians believed that, in fact, time wasn't uh, a linear, it was actually a circle. Uh, and and we keep you know repeating things over and over and over. It's just that you're in that fractal time where you seeing your little bit of um, uh, uh, space, right? And, and and you're seeing well, it looks like it's linear, uh, but maybe you're right. Maybe there's something else going on here um, in terms of us being um, um, not looking at the really big picture. Right, right. Um, because when you look at the markets and I've spoken to a few people uh, and basically we're all, you're right, we're all trying to figure out, you know, how does it work and how can we predict and machine learning, you know, factor modeling and, 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 and trying to find a reasoning behind it. Um, well, in fact, we, the, the, the bigger picture might be expect, you know, uh, escaping us. Uh, it has nothing to do, first of all, I think we realize now that it's nothing much to do with financials anymore, right? right. Um, uh, so we're getting into um, um, alternative data. You know, is, it, is, it the, is, it, is it the web traffic? Uh, is it something else that's, that's driving this, this thing? Um, but yet something is driving it. Something I always tell my student is, hey, uh, Maybe it's luck, but luck is what we really don't understand, right? I mean, when you, if you're going to drop a, a, a pen, uh, you know it's going to drop. It's not like, oh, maybe it goes up. Uh, uh, it's going to drop. So it's not luck. There's no luck involved. It's just that we know what's put, making the, 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 the pen drop. We just don't know really what's getting the market to go where it goes. In addition to that, uh, block theory tells us that maybe you know the past, the present, the future, it it's already there. We haven't seen it yet, but it's there. And I think uh, is it Einstein that, that came up with that theory? Uh, I forgot. But there's something such a thing called as block theory, mm -hmm. where uh, frankly, uh, yeah, you you think you're moving through time, but you're not really moving through time. You're just moving through the present, but uh, which you need just you just have to discover it because it's already there. And that's Absolutely. why I think it's interesting what you're saying is because you know there's something out there and, you, and, and, and we're all trying to find little bits of that. You can make a lot of money just by predicting <laughs> some of those little bits and pieces and that's what we're doing. But maybe there's something you know, larger, right? Through time that's, that, that we don't see yet or we're seeing bits and pieces and sometimes we're lucky enough to catch it. And we think, yeah. yes, machine learning. Yes, if you look at uh, what was it when Netflix uh, crashed by sixty percent? Right, right. If you were to look at the the hiring patterns at Netflix at that time, you would have found that it was dropping. Well, I guess if they don't feel like hiring people, 
internally they know something is going on. So I guess if you knew that, um, then you could have predicted the drop. Um, so how do we and how do we approach this? Go ahead. Well, the the you know the, you, the Netflix example is an interesting one because certainly from you know there's enough granularity in the data that we can. Uh, at a minimum, uh, make assessments as to whether there's a bullish or bearish bias. Um, but the other part, which was interesting, is is things like Netflix, for which there's a a, a strong social component. That, um, there's a biological and behavioral component, and and one of the you know areas that we, uh, I'd, I'd looked at it some time back, and in fact, I was actually uh, through a book that Arya had. Uh, acquired I mean, she, you know, she's been very involved in the visual arts and um, uh, i think uh, the name of the book was the drawing on the right right side of the brain by Lee betty edwards so th the interesting uh, part was the way uh, you know actually let me uh, are you why don't you uh, you remember that book why don't you talk about that a little bit yeah uh, the book was about um different ways that we draw using psychological mechanisms and Betty Edwards had used the research done by Roger Sperry to write the book, and he ended up winning a Nobel Prize later on. But Roger Sperry was a psychobiologist whose research had focused on the human brain hemisphere function. And he had came to found that the human brain used two fundamentally different modes of thinking, one that consisted of verbal, analytical, and sequential, uh, methods, which was known as the left brain, and the other that was more visual, perceptual, and simultaneous, which is the right side of the brain. And what what was the, you know, with, with, like in that book, they talked about the perception of time. Did you recall how that, that okay. Yeah, so the perception of time in terms of drawing, I think that Many artists have spoken about seeing things a little differently when drawing, me included. And we we often mention that like drawing tends to put us into a somewhat altered state of awareness. And in that different subjective state, artists speak about feeling transported or at one with, with their work. I know whenever I'm drawing, I tend to lose track of time because I'm so immersed within what I'm doing that I just I lose track of time. And while we're at one with the work, we're able to grasp relationships between um, things that we may not necessarily grasp when we are aware of the passage of time. And so this awareness of the passage of time tends to fade away and we're deceived from the consciousness. And I think a lot of artists say that they feel alert and aware when they're, when they're relaxed and free of anxiety, and yet they're experiencing a pleasurable, almost uh, mystical activation of the mind through artistry so that 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 part of it was was interesting because when um you know you you, you mentioned how like you, even the netflix example that we can we can use data uh, and you know understand you know behavioral patterns to at least assess you know uh, near-term directional tra trajectories but the the time part is where it's really interesting because instead of a single let's say like a five percent you know, drop in the, in the price because of, you know, missing projections with an enormous drop. And those type of, you know, you know, type of events occur extraordinarily rarely. And so the, 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 the question that, I, the, the, you know, it kind of goes back to the, the fundamental question, what I was trying to figure out is that, um, like, you know, you can think of artists that, you know, you lose sense of trying when you've made this shift from sort of your left analytical side of the, you know, the brain to the right, uh, you know, more visual perceptive side. And if that's the case at an individual level, is it also can we extend it, you know, to a large population like herd behavior? And so, in cases like Netflix, is that did that type of shift occur, uh, you know, at a global level in terms of behavioral patterns, uh, which uh, allowed for an, an enormous, you know, sort of shift uh, in, in you know, manifested as price behavior? And if that's the case, is there a way um, that we can, you know? You know, use quantitative approaches to actually identify those specific points, you know, all along, let's say, a linear timeline in which, you know, you're, one should expect an enormous movement, you know, up or down, let's say, in the trajectory or something, or an enormous shift in volatility, as opposed to, you know, merely using, let's say, a, a, you know, a traditional signal that, you know, should be bullish or bearish. So that, that was sort of the, the, uh, 
uh, you know, interesting part of that, that, you know, we started to work on, I mean, we looked at different techniques like log periodic power law, which you know, it was interesting uh, in you know, trying to identify these type of inflection points, but, you know, wholly incomplete by, by you know, many measurements. But what would you use, uh, and I address that question to Aria as well, how do we, what, so what do we use to, uh, I mean, it's not like we have a clock that's measuring the time that's going on in every single action that's happening out there where, you know, another clock is speeding very fast because somehow they, they are seeing, uh, they're being angst all at the same time and, or they're not. Uh, it's almost like a gauge, you know, because you, you know, how do you know, how do you know that what has happened? Um, uh, the only reason you know that there is a past is because you could remember it. Otherwise, technically, you know, you would know when, you know, if you the, if you're an embryo, you wouldn't feel bad of not being born. You know what I mean? So it's all about um, conceptually how how to look at it. Now you're asking us a very difficult question. You're, <laughs> you're saying, uh, you got enough, forget all that. No, no, no. There's something else going on. And it has to do with the way we, we are we are viewing the time, like almost a time compression, I guess, if you, you know, if you were to, to fly, uh, you know, miles away from Earth uh, versus being here. In fact, time for everyone is different, believe it or not. Yeah. I mean, you don't see it, um, but somehow to try to capture. And the only way we're capturing it is really through their actions, right? We're capturing it through, um, 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 we think. We think we're capturing it through the, you know, the in, in the case of Netflix or the fact that they've dropped, uh, they haven't been hiring people. But is that really what's driving? It happens to match. It happens to make sense. But is it really what's driving it? But what would you, what could you possibly use as a, as another measure? I mean. Um... No, absolutely, and and and. You know, when we look at uh, sort of the the attempts uh, in this regard uh, that you know, sort of traditional cycle theorists theorists such as uh, uh, you know Kondratiev and Juggler Kitchen, um, you know, people like that, they've generally when they've tried to uh, look at economic, generally economic and market phenomena through the prism of time, uh, they've largely used you know fixed you know with slight variation in terms of you know cycles. You know, Chondrite of waves, I think, like forty to sixty years apart. Um, you know, applied to you know economic behavior. Uh, juggler, you know, used fixed investment cycles of seven to eleven years. Uh, Kitchen, you know, forty. I think it was forty month cycles. Uh, Dewey, you know, had a you know somewhat you know nonlinear approach. You know, seventeen point seven five years, but you know some nonlinear as nonlinearity uh, aspect to it. Um, but they've they've largely uh, with attempts to basically identify um, meaningful inflection points in the future, you know, from a pure time uh, perspective, you know, regardless of, of what's happening with, with price. Um, but they've they've you know the those type of approaches, you know, what we've noticed is that uh, you know you know they'll, they'll occasionally be right. It's just like a broken clock to be right, uh, you know, you know twice a day. Um, but they're not consistent, and therefore they're not, uh, you know, practically can apply it from a you know, from a portfolio perspective or really any other perspective. And um, but you know, there's actually some interesting work that uh, Martin Armstrong has done um, with his approach to, to cycles, and, and he kind of looks at, you know, measuring. Um, he did actually did some interesting work. What he, what he did is he took the, um, he looked at the, I think it was the past two hundred plus years. Uh, the number of uh, you know panics that had occurred over you know that period of time, and panics has you know, kind of measured by either either economic behavior, you know, substantial GDP contractions, market behavior like you know the twenty nine crash, eighty seven crash, things like that. And uh, then he looked at you know you know roughly what is the average duration between these panics, and he found that to be uh, eight point six one years. That in of itself is you know on on average there should be some sort of you know, uh, uh, shift in economic confidence every 0.6 years. The interesting part was when he, um, you know, there were actually two interesting parts. He, you know, he took that measure, this fixed measure, 
uh, started moving it forward from the 1929 crash. Okay, I mean, occasionally, you know, you're unbound to have you know, some major hits along the way. Uh, one of them happened to be the the 87 crash, like like to the day. Um, that that was interesting, but you know, we can you know, with a large enough sample, we're going to see that type of behavior. The more interesting aspect is when he converted 8.6 years to um, to days number of days you know that are in 8.6 years you found that to be 3141 days which happens to be pi times 1000 kind of going back to the you know, your comment with the, with respect to the egyptians and so that made him think okay is there some you know some frequency component to time something that's measurable let's say you know if we kind of talk in terms of the frequencies that if we look at you know a series of frequencies and and you know with different sort of starting and ending points, can that start to give us some sense on a forward basis um, to be able to predict to the day on this day, Netflix is, is going to have an unusually large, you know, two, three, four standard deviation move as opposed to just a day in which there may be a, you know, an inflection. And so his work is kind of, you know, it's somewhat interesting in that regard. Um, but you know, even then, I think uh, from we, you know, as we get more data, we certainly get a lot more alternative data. You mentioned, uh, you know, credit card transactions, web traffic. Uh, I think it still it seems to still fundamentally go back to that. There's there's this sort of behavioral, you know, almost like you know, bio you know, or psychobiological biological component, which is actually difficult to measure. And and and, and you know, when you mentioned the the book Free Will and Time, um, which you know I haven't read, but, but I know it's, I've come across the title. I haven't actually read the book, but Berkson, yeah, Berkson is wrote an incredible book on that. Yeah. So the inter like the one interesting part I found about it was that uh, you know his sort of contention that you know, you know math physicists and mathematicians conceive time as measurable constructly, you know, spatial dimensions, but in our experience, uh, you know, we perceive it, perceive it to be continuous and unmeasurable. And you know, a six, you know, rather than a succession of marked off states of consciousness. So that you know made that it kind of it was very interesting that you were reading that book. Uh, but uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more. But if you have, uh, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll share. Maybe you know, we're probably going to need another session because that's going to uh, just talk <laughs> about his. But I mean, you know what? I, I think what you're saying basically feels like it's like dark, dark matter, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We we know it's there. Because there's no way this whole thing could fit together, but we can't see it. And I think that's exactly what's happening here. Yeah. Um, and, and then now that you bring out the notion of free will, I mean, uh, when you look at Bergson's um, um, writings, I mean, it's, it's philosophical, obviously. But, but it does, as Aria mentioned, there is a there is an emotional component of how we look at time. Now, um, there was some uh, recent, uh, there's research done on free will recently. And um, we're basically, I mean, all these traders making those decisions, you're assuming that they're doing it, they, they, they do have a free will, right? But we have shown and, 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 and proven that before you make a decision, right, the brain are, has already made that decision for you. And this is what's scary. I mean, for example, if I were to ask a bunch of people, hey, uh, name me a country, uh, a European city, you are not going to name a country that you do not know. So, so you don't have the free will to decide whatever you want, right? Your will is probably constructed and built to around, well, only a few cities, you know, England and, and I mean, uh, Paris and London. And I mean, I got to know those cities. If I don't know them, I'm not going to be able to tell you what they are. So you don't really have, Total free will, but what they've shown is that they have done uh, literally um, um, with brain waves showing when the instant the decision that you made versus the brain waves left your brain, so to speak, and say, "Okay, do it." There is a fraction of time; it's not instantaneous. So when you decide something, you—that's you, not when you decided. You decided it. A little while ago so there is a there is a space there is a time here as well now is it yours or is it your brain or is it a combination of all your experience together that makes you decide that point are you really that free will and that would make sense then to have a market that's kind of deciding things 
uh, that can be predicted because at the end of the day, they're not really deciding anything. Because if time is locked and you have no free will, then you just have to find the right combination. It's a big circle that keeps going over and over and over. So there's definitely research to be done. Um, I mean, some people are, are lucky enough to, to, to find it once in a while and consistently enough. And because we have so much data now, it's becoming possible to look for these things, I think. But then if we do find it, then what's the fun in it then, right? I mean, you better not tell anyone about it that you found <laughs> it. <laughs> you found it. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be everyone. This is most interesting, but I have to stop here. Uh, I don't want to go on too, too far. Down. Okay, so what we have decided today is that instead of focusing only on um, uh, you know alternative data and uh, maybe we should take a more grandiose approach to time itself and understand that there is something else that's guiding this principle. And I'd be curious to hear about more about that research that you mentioned, but we'll do it, uh, we'll do it off track. Uh, Aria, Guraj, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we'll definitely have, have another session. Maybe I'll, I'll do a, a special podcast with Aria on that book because there seems to be a lot more uh, in it. Uh, and it sounds quite interesting. Well, thank you very much for your time and uh, we'll pick this up at a later date. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.